scripture reading for today comes from the first chapter of the book of Matthew. This passage is typically called the begats because so-and-so begot so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. But this is from a more updated translation of the Bible, the Common English Bible. So listen for the word of the Lord. A record of the ancestors of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Aram. Aram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Ubijah. Ubijah was the father of Asaph. Asaph was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Joram. Joram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Yotham. Yotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amos. Amos was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jeconiah and his brothers. This was the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Yekonia was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Ubiud. Ubiud was the father of Eliukim. Eliukim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Akim. Akim was the father of Uliud. Uliud was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Mathan. Mathan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 generations from the exile to Babylon to the Christ. So friends, even though it sounds a little strange that that was in the Bible, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in a situation where you ask someone their name, they say it, but you don't hear what they said, so you ask again, and they say it again, and you still don't catch it? Then you've got to pretend like you actually heard their name because you don't want to appear rude, and so you've got to find some other way to go about learning their name. Anyone had that happen to them, or was it just me? Sometimes there's a really neat story why someone has the name that they do. Maybe it was a family name. Maybe their name is related to a circumstance into which they were born. Maybe their parents just really liked the name. So a name isn't always just a name, right? Sometimes it's really interconnected with a person's identity. And that was quite a list of names I just read from Matthew that makes even the most seasoned scripture reader groan when that passage comes up to be read aloud. I have a little book, this is my trade secret, 
which tells you how to pronounce every name in the Bible based on what we know about how biblical languages were spoken. And even writing it out phonetically, which I did, I'm sure I didn't say them all correctly. So in biblical times, sometimes a baby was given a name that pertained to the conception, like Isaac. His name means he will laugh because Abraham and Sarah laughed when God told them that they would have a child at their elderly ages. Or a baby's name could have something to do with the delivery. Like Jacob. His name means heel, like the heel of a foot, because he was born grasping the heel of his brother Esau. And so Hebrew naming customs have changed over time, and they've taken on different meanings and characteristics based on what was going on in the history and the culture of the people. <coughs> Excuse me. But even today, Hebrew names are often chosen because they have a family connection, because they spell out who the parents hope the child will become, or even because of inspiration from a person in the Bible. And so I apologize to the legacy of each of the people in Jesus's genealogy whose name I might have butchered while I was reading Matthew 1. So in this list of names, there are 42, 42 names organized into three sets of 14. So there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the time the Israelites were exiled in Babylon, and 14 generations from the Babylonian exile to Jesus. So the number 14 is 2 times 7. And 7 is a number that appears a lot in the Bible. And it represents wholeness or completion. So it's probably not merely a coincidence that these numbers work out in Matthew to be multiples of 7. And if you read about each of the people mentioned in this Old Testament, in this genealogy of Jesus, if you read about them in the Old Testament, you'll find stories of trauma and triumph and beauty. Even if you simply read the stories of the five women mentioned here, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, you'll find stories of heartache, of unlikely women using what little agency they have, and this, this strong mama bear instinct to protect the people they love. And there is so much complexity that leads us through the names, and then we get to Jesus. Now, I want to be clear about this before we go any further. Christ is not Jesus' last name. And his middle initial certainly wasn't H. I don't know where that comes from, but none of that is true. In the naming customs of the time, Jesus would likely have been Jesus bar Joseph or Jesus, son of Bar, Joseph. And so let's talk about the word Christ. It's not a name. It's a title. It is an anglicized version of the Greek Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word that means Messiah. The Hebrew word for Messiah means to anoint. And so lots of people in the Bible were anointed. Kings, prophets, even the tabernacle was anointed in Leviticus. And what an anointing did was set someone apart for God. 
So a king wasn't just a rich person who ruled over the poor people, but he was seen as someone called and anointed by God to do the Lord's work. And we certainly know Jesus was anointed by God. He was the anointed one. And the people of Jesus' time were hoping for a ruler to come and overthrow the empire. For a ruler who would regather those in exile. And for a ruler who would reinstitute a reign of justice and peace. These people were longing for social change, for wrongs to be righted, for someone to step in and rescue them. Enter Jesus, stage right. And because we know the full story, because we're on the other side of the cross, we know how society reacted against the message Jesus brought. We know the disciples were slow to learn a whole new way of worshiping and believing in God. And we know the whole experience cost Jesus his earthly life. And we certainly look forward to rejoicing over the gift of resurrection in a few months at Easter. But at the start of Advent, we spend time thinking about what's in a name. Why the title Christ? What does it really mean for the baby born to frighten parents in a stable beside the animals to be Messiah, the Christ? the anointed one. And when we think about the first candle that we light on the Advent wreath, the candle of hope, what does hope look like when that baby is born on the hay? It's more than a mere expectation of things to come. It's the hope of of salvation and the hope that God with us will change us and change the world. Because the hope of Christ isn't just tied to the, to the baby in the manger. The hope of Christ continues today. And we continue to hope for Christ who will overthrow the empire, who will regather those in exile, and who will institute a reign of justice and peace. That hope wasn't resolved when Jesus walked the earth. That hope continues still today. So the theme we're using at Valley United Presbyterian Church this Advent season is called From Generation to Generation. And we're going to look at who are the people who shaped the earthly Jesus into who he was. What are the pathways of the stories that lead to the miraculous arrival of God into the world? And what stories are neglected? Or forgotten. So on this first Sunday in Advent, we pass along what's in a title. We are preparing ourselves to receive the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One on Christmas Day. And so we spend time during Advent reflecting, reading scripture, confessing, praying, and strengthening our relationship with that God-man who will be born in the manger. So what's in a name? What's in a title? Hope. Peace. 
love, joy. Everything is in that title. Amen.